How are y'all doing today? You look so rested. Hey, I know one thing I know today is going to be a good day. Do you know how? First service, we're doing communion. I opened the bottom for that bread. Two crackers fell out. So today <laughs> is a good day. The blessing of the Lord is in this room. There's a story that's told in my family. And every time I actually tell this story, I have to go back to my dad and ask if it's true. Because it seems too miraculous to be true. And it's true. Uh, if you don't know, I'm of Japanese descent. Uh, last name Suzuki. Very, one of the most popular last names, common last names in Japan. But some, several generations ago, I had a relative that was in Japan. And he had this revelation from the Lord. He knew, he had this revelation that there was a God. And he could know this God. But he couldn't know him if he stayed in Japan. You see, at the time, there were no missionaries in Japan. There were no churches in Japan. There was not a real viable way for this relative to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he sensed this calling, this drawing from the Lord, and he found his way into a merchant vessel bound for the Pacific Northwest of the United States of America, landed up there, found his way into a Christian church, heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, and gave his heart to the Lord, and followed him with his life. In a large part because of what God has done, I think, I really believe that's why I'm here today. That's why I'm part of this church. That's why there's this kind of strange legacy and movement of faith in my dad's side of the family, because God drew this relative from his homeland to here. And even right now, you're thinking about this story. It's just like, wow, how beautiful, how good, how God that loves, that draws, that beckons people to himself. Some of you might be thinking about this place, the fact that he came here, and maybe you're thankful. You're thinking, man, I'm so glad, I'm so blessed to live in a place like the United States of America, where it's, we have the freedom of religion, the freedom. You're here today. No one's stopping you. No one's going to stop you from worshiping God right here. And that you're thinking about all the things that are happening, this blessing of this place, and it is good. It's good that in every town, every, in almost every street corner, you can find a Christian church where you can celebrate and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ week in and week out. But for some of you, maybe it's asking this, you're thinking this other question. You're thinking about, man, you're asking maybe, am I only a Christian? Do I only have faith? Am I only sitting in this room because I was born here? Because I was born in a place where Christianity is still the dominant religion. Maybe you're thinking about someone that's outside of this place, that's in another country, that's another place. Like, what about them? How do they hear? Am I just the winner of some sort of strange geographical lottery? That I just struck the jackpot, that I got lucky to be born in a place like this. Maybe it's bringing up another question when you're thinking about my relative traveling to the United States. Maybe it just makes you think about Christianity in the U.S. today. Maybe there's a lot of questions you're thinking about that. We got an election coming up. We're not going to talk about that yet, but we're in an election year. It's coming. You're starting to think about the state of Christianity in America. Maybe that doesn't seem quite healthy to you. Maybe it doesn't seem like it's heading in the right direction. So now, we're gonna re I'm going to reveal in the question. If you look at your outlines or you're following along in our Three Crosses app, you can see in your notes today, the question we're asking today, seeking to answer is, is Christianity made in America? Is Christianity made in America? So let's go. We're going to take a little journey today through the scriptures. We're going to look through church history. We're going to look at some statistics. I know that you all woke up today to come hear some numbers and stats and look at some charts, and I got them for you. But through that, we're going to see God's plan for us. We're going to see God's plan for the U.S. And we're going to see God's plan for the entire world. So before we dive into that, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask that he would bless our morning, bless our time, and bless us and guide us as we look for him in this world. So Lord God, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for all that you've given us. We thank you for blessing us. We thank you for um, the blessing of even this place where many of us were born, many of us grew up. Uh, the, the United States, a place where we can hear about you. It's easy to, f to seek and find you. There's churches all over the place. We're so thankful for that. And Lord, we're also mindful for people all over the world, maybe some that don't have the same opportunities that we have. We're mindful of, of them, 
how will they know you? But we're mindful about the state of, our, of Christianity in, our, in this nation. And so, Lord, we got questions, we ha- and you have answers. Uh, we have concerns, and you have guidance. So, Lord, help us to find that today. Help us to see you in all of this. In Jesus' name, amen. So I think that first part of that question is, what about those people that aren't born in a place like this? Think about people that are born all over the world. Maybe you're thinking about that right now. You know, you're born right here. What about someone that's born in a place that's not predominantly Christian, where there's not churches on every street corner? What about someone that's born in China? What about someone that's born in India? What about someone that's born in some of the far-flung regions of the world? What happens with them? How are they going to hear? Maybe you even feel a sense of guilt about your own life. Man, I have been able to enjoy being born here. It was easy in a certain way to hear about the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You might even feel a sense of guilt like, man, I would trade spots so someone else could hear the gospel. You know, a lot of times, even when we're asking that question or feeling that concern or sensing that, I think we're still looking through the lens that we have here in the United States. We're making assumptions about what God is doing all over the world, and we're assuming, man, it's here. Maybe he's not out there. But here we go, getting into some numbers. You ready for numbers? Came to church for numbers, right? Here's what God is doing. Let me, there was a study done by Gordon Conwell st- uh, Seminary that was released uh, this year. It's this incredible study about the growth of Christianity, the gospel movement throughout the entire world. Here we go. I'm going to explain some numbers, and then I'm going to show you a chart, and I hope that you're encouraged by it. In 1900, 95% of all Christians globally lived in majority Christian countries. So think about that. Back in the 1900s, most Christians lived in a place where Christians were the, was the, Christianity was the dominant religion. Think about European nations. Think about the United States. That's where the vast majority, 95% of Christians were. Now, in 2022, that number has fallen to 53.7%. By 2050, most Christians, over 50% around the world, will live in non-majority Christian nations. Now, let me tell you why that's good news. It's not, just be, it's not because primarily they're shrinking in these Christian majority nations. It's not just because there is a, a shrinking of the population of Christians. It's this explosive growth and expansion of Christianity in places that did not... Uh, typically and historically have a lot of Christians in them. Think about nations that are predominantly Buddhist in faith. There is a growth, an explosive growth of Christians in those places. Places like India, a place of uh, primarily Hindu faith, an explosive growth of Christianity. Places like, and I want to highlight this, in Africa, where there's a variety of Islam and a variety of traditional religions, there's an explosive growth in Christianity. We see this so clearly in Africa. In 1900, twice as many Christians lived in Europe than the rest of the world combined. Today, more Christians live in Africa than any other continent. Listen to this. By 2050, Africa will be home to almost 1.3 billion Christians. While Latin America, 686 million, Asia, 560 million will have more, have more than Europe, 497 million, and North America, 276 million. Do you hear that? It's this movement of the gospel. It's not just a contraction wherever it was previously a Christian place. It's this expansion, this explosive growth, the movement of the gospel all over the world. And we can celebrate this and be overjoyed at what God is doing that he's not restricted to certain places and nationalities and different, he's not restricted by borders or politics or anything like that, that his message, his gospel is going out into the entire world through the proclamation of missionaries and church planners and pastors and Christians just like you and me and through visions and dreams. Uh, Pastor Mark will tell you there's this movement in Africa of imams, Muslim religious leaders having visions of Jesus that a Jesus will appear to them in a dream and tell them, go find a church planner, go find a pastor, go find an evangelist, go find a Christian so they can tell you the good news about me. And there's this movement and this thing that's happening. I want to show this chart from that growth in Africa. You see that orange line? 1900, 9% in Africa claiming Christianity. 2010, 57% of people in Africa identifying themselves as Christians. You see this explosive growth that all over the world, God is at work, that the gospel is proclaimed and people are giving their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And so God has a reminder for us. Sometimes we're looking right here and just wondering, is it just a geographical lottery? Is it just because I was born here? And God's inviting us to lift up our eyes and to look out at what he's doing all over the world. He is at work. He is moving. He is doing incredible things. And he is revealing himself to men and women, just like that relative in Japan. He's revealing himself to them. You think about what the psalmist tells us, that the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. That we go out, we look at the stars in the sky, we behold nature and all of creation. We sense our inner being. We see our fellow men and women around us. And we sense and see the fingerprints of God. The Apostle Paul, the epistle to the Romans, says that God has revealed himself to all so that we are without excuse. That God is showing up, just like he did for my relative. Showing up and saying, drawing people to him. We have a God that's a global God. Jesus, before he ascended into heaven, the last thing he did, the last thing he said for his disciples, and that's for us too, any of us who call on the name of Jesus, he gave them the great commission to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. That even from the beginning, the movement of the gospel was a global movement to go out and make disciples of all nations. We have a God that has a concern for the nations. He has a concern for people everywhere and anywhere. And we have a God that's a global God. And the gospel from the beginning is a global movement. You know, that question we start with, is Christianity made in America? We all know the answer to that is no. It didn't start here. It started in Jerusalem. It started at Pentecost as the, first, as the apostles declared, believe in Jesus, his, res- his death and his resurrection so that you can have forgiveness and life. Enter into a new kingdom, a new family, a new people. It spread from there into the surrounding area of Judea and Samaria. It spread into the Roman world. It found a home in Europe. It migrated here to the United States and now is going out through Latin America, Asia, and Africa. A global movement of God's power, his presence, and a kingdom being built for all eternity. This is our God. This is who we serve. And think about that. Right now, there are people all over our community. They're in, they're in a church right now worshiping the same God worshiping the same Jesus. But think about this. Later today, or even earlier today, in churches, in homes, in fields, all over the world, people are worshiping the same God we worship right here. We're part of this global movement. Irenaeus was one of the church fathers who ministered in the early 8100s. Here's what he says. For the churches which have been planted in Germany do not believe or hand down, hand down anything different nor do those in Spain, nor those in Gaul, that's France, nor those in the East, nor those in Egypt, nor those in Libya, nor those have been which have been established in the central regions of the world. But as the Son, the creature of God, is one and the same throughout the whole world. So the preaching of the truth shineth everywhere and enlightens all men that are willing to come to a knowledge of the truth. You are a part of this global movement of the gospel. You are not the winners of a haphazard geographical lottery. You are a part of a kingdom movement that God has a plan for us for. That you have a God that loves you, that cares for you, that seeks you, that wants to reach you. He does it through the proclamation of the gospel, through the sharing of your testimonies, even through visions and dreams. We have a God that will go to any length to draw all people to himself. Aren't you so glad that your God is like that? Aren't you so ha- rejoicing? That he's at work. He is at work everywhere. Even when we say that, we think about that global movement. You look at those stats like, man, look at that. That movement of the gospel, this explosive thing that's happening. People getting saved all over the place. 1.3 billion Christians in Africa in the next 25 years. Incredible. But then we start to think about, so what's going on here? What's going on here in the U.S.? Why are we having such problems? Why is Christianity, think about Christianity in America, it's just facing this strife, controversy from inside the church and outside 
the church. And isn't it different? I mean, I, I am not that old yet. But I'll tell you, it is different even than when I was a kid. Even when I was a teenager. For some of you in this room, you've, like for me growing up, being a Christian wasn't a negative. At best, it was an asset that people were like, oh, okay, he's trustworthy, he's good, like he's got some, some things going for him. Or it was neutral. Like, oh, you're a Christian, so what? If you're a little bit older, maybe you're a Gen Xer or a boomer, you can remember a time when Christianity was absolutely a plus. That almost everyone you knew could identify themselves as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus. They went to church on Sunday. They were consistent members, uh, that kind of contributing members of their church and their community. But in the last several years, especially around election cycles and things like that, and again, we're not going to get into elections today. I'm not going to talk about the politics of everything today, but I want to show you a little bit of what's been happening and where we see that. Because there's been this strange intermingling of Christianity broadly in our country and politics and power and policy and institutions. I think that's a lot of, where a lot of us, even when we're looking, at, when we're, this question, the reason we're tackling this question is because it is one of the most common questions that people ask from people inside the church and outside the church. What's the deal with Christians, politics, power, policy, institution. I read this quote from Donald Trump before he became president. He was speaking at a rally. And here's what he says. And by the way, Christianity will have power. Because if you're going to have, and because if I'm there, if I'm president, you're going to have plenty of power. You don't need anybody else. You're going to have somebody representing you very, very well. Remember that. You've probably heard quotes like this, not just from, from Donald Trump. It's not just from people on the right. It's people on the left, people vying for this kind of association between Christians, power, politic, all these different things that's kind of intermingling. And I think for most of us, when we hear things like that, it unsettles us, stirs something in us. Maybe you're thinking about what, the, what James, the brother of Jesus, writes, to not to favor those who are powerful or rich, because they can be, they're predominantly the oppressors of the church. You're wondering, like, are we really supposed to be getting into this? Maybe you're thinking about the words of Paul from 1 Timothy or 1 Thessalonians, where he calls on Christians to live quiet, humble lives, that by their conduct, by their testimony, by their proclamation of the gospel, that some would be saved. Maybe you hear this quote, and there's probably some of you in this room that are thinking, like, yeah, that's the problem. Not enough power. We don't have enough power as Christians. Maybe some of you are thinking, yeah, that's the problem. We're trying to get power instead of trusting in the Lord. But regardless of where you fall, the answer to that question, regardless of how you feel, I think we can all agree that there's a problem. That something isn't quite right. I think we all have this very real sense when you think about it, that Christianity is on the decline in the U.S., that we've lost some level as Christians, we've lost a level of influence. We've lost a level of relevance. And maybe the tendency is to try to find all these different ways to hold on, to hold on to that power, to hold on to those things. Because it feels like Christianity might be on the way out in the U.S. Maybe you feel that. And probably the reason that you feel that Probably the reason you feel that kind of tension, that kind of loss, that, that diminishing influence of Christianity is because it's true. Take a look at this chart. Pew uh, Research Center did this, has done this long-term study. It was released a, uh, a couple years ago in 2021. And it shows the decline. It show, demonstrates the decline of Christianity. They asked a question to people, what is your religion? What is your religious affiliation? In 1972... Only 50 years ago, 1972, 90% of Americans would identify themselves as Christians. 90% of Americans identified themselves as Christians. Take a look at that chart. That's the brown line up at the top. And look at how that drops. 2019, 64% identify themselves as Christians. And that number continues to fall. Do you see that black line towards the bottom? It starts at 5%. That's the leading area of growth in this kind of, this, the largest trending category is people who say, like, when, I, when they would be asked, what religion are you? They would say, none. 
I have no religious affiliation. T today, it's, it was at tw uh, 29% in 2019 and is climbing. And even when you look at that chart, you see why we feel the way that we feel. It feels like Christianity, our influence, is declining because it is. Less people who claim to follow Jesus, less people in our churches, less people walking with the Lord. And it begins to make us wonder, like, what's happening? Maybe it makes you ask questions, like, what's go where are we going wrong? Maybe, for me, it made me think, you know, I think about my, if, my, if that relative, if God was calling him today, if God was stirring in his heart and said, leave your land, go find me, would he even call him here anymore? Or would he call him somewhere else? Where there's that movement of the gospel. Maybe you feel this, that kind of unsettled feeling. Pastor S. Ephraim Smith, pastor of Midtown Church in Sacramento, was here on our stage a few weeks ago. We, had our exponent, we hosted an exponential church planning and evangelism conference. And Pastor Ephraim Smith was talking about this very issue, talking about the kind of Christianity and national scene and said, there's this tendency that we have as believers, there's this tendency that we have that when this, this, this difficulty, when we sense that we're losing this influence and authority in our nation, there's a tendency to... Circle the wagons to look down here and say, I need to build this earthly empire. If I get the right politicians, the right policies, the right institutions, the right thing, if I get things lined up, then things will work out. Then things will happen for me. Then Christianity will be returned, restored to its place of power and influence in our society. But Pastor Smith reminds us, it's not about building this earthly empire. It's about lifting our eyes up and working alongside God as he builds his eternal kingdom. We're not going to make our own little heaven here. We look up and join with the Lord as he brings a little bit of heaven to earth through people like you and like me. Draws people to believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ that they might be invited into an eternal home. And so today, maybe you're wondering, is there even hope for Christianity in America? Is there hope for it? Well, if there is, it will require us to lift our heads up and build this eternal kingdom. You know what we call that, type, that kind of work, that kind of attitude? We call that revival. We call that revival. Check this out. This is a quote from the late Timothy Keller. Incredible about the movement, the, the potential revival that exists right here. Listen to it. The church in the U.S. can grow again if it strikes a dynamic balance between innovation and conservation. A church must conserve historic Christian teachings. If a church simply adopts the beliefs of the culture, it will die because it has nothing unique to offer. It tells, tells what we're trying to do, what we're endeavored to do every single week, every day here at Three Crosses, that we want to conserve, we're orthodox, we follow the traditional teachings of Jesus. We're preaching from the word of God week in and week out. This is our guiding light that we would know the word of God and live it out with our lives as Christians have done for thousands of years. We don't want to just become a social movement, although we want to bring a good to our society. We want to be different, marked by the Lord. But listen to what he says. But the church has always, especially in times when faith seems more about, like just like now in the U.S., introduced unexpected innovations. There was no such thing as monasticism through which pagan Northern Europe was turned Christian until there was. There was no reformation until there was. There was no revival that turned Methodists and Baptists into a culturally dominant forces in the Midwestern and Southeastern United States until there was. There was no East African revival led primarily by African people that helped turn Africa from a 9% Christian continent in 1900 into a 50% Christian continent today until there was. Listen to this last sentence. Christianity, like its founder, does not go from strength to strength, but from death to resurrection. That is our God. Christianity is on decline in the United States. There's no question about that. And if we want to change that, if we want to turn that around, we need eternal resurrection, revival, power. 
We need people like you and like me to live lives that are worthy of the gospel, to share our faith, to go out there and make a difference in this place so that people might know Jesus, might celebrate and, and believe in the power of his death and resurrection and his gift of eternal life. So now we're going to lift our heads up and instead of worrying about all the things, the politics, the policies, the institutions, all those things that are happening around us, instead of worrying about where we're born or what are the circumstances of our life, we get to join with Jesus in this global movement of the gospel. That is his invitation to you today. You are a recipient and a participant in the kingdom of God, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It started in Jerusalem, moved out into Judea, Samaria, and went to the uttermost parts of the earth, even here in the United States of America. And our invitation from God is to join him in that work to bring salvation, to bring the good news of the gospel in every corner of the globe. So here's what I got for you. Oh, and just remember, this is what we are. Philippians, the apostle Paul, he reminds us of who we are. What we have, Philippi, it's going to be up on the screen for you. Philippians chapter 3, listen to this. But our citizenship, your citizenship, is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. You are citizens of heaven. You are citizens of the kingdom of God. And God has placed you in a place and space right here, maybe in the surrounding community, Hayward, Castro Valley, San Leandro, San Lorenzo, but your first identity, your first allegiance, the first thing that you have and the thing that no one can take from you is a citizenship in heaven. Co-heirs with Christ, sons and daughters of God. So as we close today, as we get ready to go back out there, I wanna give you four ways that you can practically and tactically, if you're wondering, how, do I, how can I join with the Lord in this? How can I bring resurrection power? How can I be part of a revival movement? Here's what it's going to be. Here's how you can join with Jesus in the work of the Great Commission to make disciples of all nations. The first one is this. Live a life worthy of the gospel. Live a life worthy of the gospel. That's your first blank. You know, God, through the prophet Jeremiah, told his people who were exiled in the nation of Babylon, seek the peace and prosperity of the place that you live. Seek the peace and prosperity of the place that you live. Let me break that down for you. The Israelites, the Jewish people, had been exiled by God. They had been conquered by Babylon because they'd been wayward from God. They, the Babylonians took them from their homes, destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, and God is calling on his people, not saying the Babylonians are your enemies, not saying stay away from them, separate yourself from them. No, instead, he says, you know those people? who destroyed my temple, who took you from your home, go and seek the good, good for them. Go seek peace and prosperity for them. Go be a light and a witness for me, even in a nation that should be your enemy. And that's for you today. If that's true for them, how much more so for us? That wherever God has you, wherever God has you, the goal isn't to view the world around you as an enemy, but as a people that need Jesus, that need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what are we doing to bring a benefit, to bring goodness? Maybe it's in your job, that you do a great work, that you're compassionate and caring for your coworkers, that maybe you'd even invite them and say like, hey, I went to church this weekend, you should come with me. Maybe buying some ice skating tickets for them. Come join, let's have a family fun time. Maybe in your schools to be generous, to sit with those who are lonely, to care for those who are hurting. Maybe it's in your community, helping a neighbor mow a lawn who's not able to do it for themselves or going and being compassionate to those around you. Live a life that's worthy of the gospel, living for the Lord and for others. You know, again, I told you about 1 Thessalonians and 1 Timothy where Paul talks, calls us, calls Christians to live a life that's worthy of the gospel, that through the way that we live, that some might be drawn to Jesus. There's this incredible letter, it's called the Epistle to Diognetus. It was written in the mid-100s, so about 100 years or so about after Jesus died. And we don't know the author, but it's a Christian author writing to a Roman official, trying to appeal to him, saying like, hey, Christians are good for society. Christians can bring a benefit to our society. And you should, you should allow Christians. Here's what he says. For the Christians, 
are distinguished from other men neither by country nor language nor the customs which they observe. For they neither inhabit cities country, uh, of their own nor employ a peculiar form of speech nor lead a life which is marked out by any singularity. The course of conduct which they follow has not been devised by any speculation or deliberation of inquisitive men, nor do they, like some, proclaim themselves the advocates of any merely human doctrine. Do you hear that? So the Christians, at that, Christians are not defined, we're not defined by the cities we live in. We don't live in Christian cities. We don't wear Christian clothes. We don't speak a strange Christian language. We are members of the places where God has placed us. That's how it's always been. That's been our call. But inhabiting Greek as well as barbarian cities, according as the lot each of them has determined, and following the customs of natives in respect to clothing, food, and the rest of their ordinary conduct, they display to us their wonderful and confessedly striking method of life. Here it is. Here's what it looks like to be a Christian wherever you live. They dwell in their own countries, but simply as sojourners, as travelers, as foreigners. As citizens, they share in all things with others, and yet endure all things as foreigners. Every foreign land to them is as their native country, and every land of their birth as a land of strangers. They marry, as do all others. They beget children, but they do not destroy their offspring. Christians value and protect life. They have a common table, but not a common bed. They are in the flesh, but they do not live after the flesh. They pass their days on earth, but they are citizens of heaven. They obey the prescribed laws and at the same time surpass the laws with their lives. They love all men and are persecuted by all. They are unknown and condemned. They are put to death and yet they're restored to life. They are poor yet make many rich. They are in lack of all things yet abound in all. They are dishonored and yet in their very dishonor are glorified. They are evil spoken of and yet are justified. They are reviled and bless. They are insulted and repay the insult with honor. They do good and yet are punished as evildoers. When punished they rejoice as if quickened to life. They are assailed by the Jews as foreigners and are persecuted by the Greeks Yet those who hate them are unable to assign them any reason for their hatred. This is the life that we're called to live as people in our societies, wherever God has placed you, whatever neighborhood, whatever city, whatever country, whatever nation, whatever part, continent on the globe God has placed you. God has called you to be salt and light. God has called you to be a representative and a witness. God has called you to live in there and to bring peace and prosperity to wherever you go to bring the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we live a life worthy of the gospel. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to determine God's call for you in your civic engagement. This one's real practical. Determine God's call for you in your civic life. So here's what it is. Some of us, we're going to live out that call that Paul has for us to live that quiet and humble life. You're going to live a quiet and humble life. Maybe you're not so concerned with what's happening at the ballot box. Maybe you don't need to be, that's not your concern. All you want to do is go out there and you want to live for Jesus wherever you go. You want to be great at what you do. You want to be a blessing to all people. You want to share the good news of the gospel. And that's what you want to do. You want to live this life so that some might know him. And if, you, if that's for you, God bless you. God empower you. God is with you. God will work through you. Some of you, God's calling you to step it up and to get more engaged in the, in the civic life of wherever you are, in this country or wherever you are from. You're going to get more engaged. Maybe for some of you, God's calling you to be a Christian politician, to run for office. You're probably going to lose, but it's going to be awesome. You know, like, wouldn't it be incredible? Wouldn't it be incredible? I, I always used to think this. Like, wouldn't it be incredible to have, like, an awesome Christian politician, like someone elected an official? Like, Castro Valley doesn't have a mayor, but let me, just, let me just run something by you. How would you feel about Larry Vold for mayor of Castro Valley? I mean, come on. It'd be amazing. It'd be amazing. Some of you, God's calling you to get more engaged, to learn a little bit more, to find, to help grow your heart for what God is doing and where God wants to shine a light wherever you are. Some of you, it's called to be more engaged. But sadly, a lot of us pick a third option, which I think none of us are called to do. And I'm going to call you to get out of it. No one in here is called to be the angry, fearful, social media warrior, Okay. Now, social media can be a good way to engage with people. I'm not saying it doesn't have its place or it's, but no one's called to be the angry, fearful person. 
No one's called to loudly proclaim their complaints for everyone to see. Because really, as we've seen it, it doesn't do anything good. It brings polarization. It does not demonstrate the grace and truth of the gospel. And some of you, to borrow a phrase, need to delete your account and get off of there because it's making you fearful, angry, all these things instead of grace-filled, loving, compassionate, engaged. There's a place for that. So determine that what God's called for you is. Maybe you got to get more engaged. Maybe you're going to keep doing what you're doing, living a life that's of humble and of quietness that some people might know the Lord through your behavior, through the sharing of your story, which takes us to the third way that you're going to be a part of a revival movement, bringing resurrection power. Share your story to transform the East Bay with the gospel. Share your story to transform the East Bay with the gospel. Think about last month, back to church month, 137 people representing more than that filled out a card. I was out there at the tent every single week. Every week someone was coming. It's my first week. This person invited me. This per- One of you invited those people that you're a part of this, like sharing your story, like, hey, come to church with me. Hey, you're going to love this series. Hey, I want you to be a part of this community. I want you to know Jesus. You're, invite- you're sharing your story and God's bringing transformation. The Apostle Paul in Romans talks about our place, that Christian's place in bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's Romans 10. How then can they, that's non-believing people, call on the one they do not believe, uh, believe in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they pr- anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. You, my brothers and sisters in Christ, you are commissioned by God, by the Lord Jesus, and sent out to share your story, to share the good news of the gospel with everyone that comes across your path. That God would bring people into your life that you might share a little bit of what God has done. And so I know some people in this room, that's a scary thing. That's a frightening thing. Maybe you don't. How do I do that? I don't know what to say. I don't know what, how to go about that. Well, good news. We've got a great class for that. We have great people to help you train you in that. We have a class called the Go Project. It meets during our community nights. And while right now it's actually coming to a close, we'll be launching a new one at the end of January. So if you're saying, like, I want to share my story. I want to learn what it means to share my faith. Sign up. Pastor AJ Venegas leads that. It's phenomenal. And it will give you the tools and the experiences you need to be able to share your story to bring transformation that God might use you. So share your story to transform the East Bay with the gospel. Love your neighbor. Care for those people around you. The last thing is this. Dwell on, celebrate, and support the global movement of the gospel. Dwell on, celebrate, and support the global movement of the gospel. A lot of times we look at what's right here and sometimes it doesn't look too good. But I want to encourage you, remind you, and show you there's God is at work. Millions upon millions of people giving their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe for you, we have a ministry called 360 Serve. Uh, Pastor Mark leads that, and you can be a part of that. For $50 a month, we support church planting pastors in developing nations, and they go out and share the gospel. And if you sign up to support one of them, you're going to get reports from Pastor Mark every month hearing stories of transformation where people by the hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands are hearing the good news of the gospel. And so in a world with a lot of bad news, there is a lot of bad news that you might dwell on and focus on and support with your time, with your, with your prayers, with your finances, what God is doing all over the world. De- dwell on, celebrate, and support the global movement of the gospel. We have a God that transcends all ethnic, all cultural, all national boundaries. He's not restricted by anything. He's not restricted by anyone. We have a God that seeks us, that cares for us. We have a God that would reach out even to one of my relatives in a far off land and call him to know him. It reminds me of Abraham in Genesis, that God shows up to Abram and says, hey, come, come follow me, and I'll show you a land I'm going to give to you. This relative of mine heard from the Lord, come follow me. He was asked, called, come leave your earthly home so you can be invited to join a heavenly home. And this is the kingdom of God. Let me read for you what the kingdom of God is going to look like as we participate in it. This is what's going to happen. It's not a question of if. It's a question of when. 
Revelation 7, starting in verse 9. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb of God. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. This is what we have in Christ. This is the eternal kingdom that you and I are a part of. This is the eternal kingdom and the movement of the gospel that we are invited to be a part of. Let's go to the Lord and ask that he would bless us, that he would give us those opportunities. So Lord God, we just thank you that you're a God that sees, that you're a God that seeks, you're a God that speaks. Lord God, that you reach out, you, you even humbled yourself, taking on the form of a servant, Lord Jesus, you put on flesh that you might live among us, that you might die for our sins, the sins of the entire world, that you would raise from the grave, showing that you had the power over sin and death. And then, Lord, you commissioned us, you sent us to go be a part of that kingdom work, building an eternal kingdom, not an earthly empire throughout the entire world that in the end we might be numbered among those people talked about in Revelation, standing shoulder to shoulder with people from every tongue, tribe, and nation, all glorifying you, Lord Jesus. So Lord, teach us how to do that. Give us opportunities to share our stories. Help us to raise our head up, our eyes up, and see what you're doing, not only here, but all over the world. And give us the strength and power to live lives worthy of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.